In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of all ages. Amen. Today's Gospel, we see the Lord's true call for every, every individual. Every single one of us is being called to the same call St. Peter was called to, and the rest of the disciples, to become fishers of men. It says that St. Peter said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. That was the reaction of St. Peter after he saw what happened with the catch of fish. The Lord's response to St. Peter's honesty was, Do not be afraid. Every time you choose to be honest with God about whatever is happening in your life at this present time, God's immediate response to you is, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, because no one who truly, honestly comes to God will be turned away. No one, ever. From now on you will catch men. Not only did the Lord tell St. Peter, don't be afraid because you're a sinful man, I'm going to use you to do things you didn't even think you would ever do. St. Peter's life in Bethsaida was a simple life, right? He was a fisherman. He went out, got the fish, came back. Very simple life, every day. But the Lord had more in store for him. Just like he has more in store for us, every one of us. Our life is not simply about Monday to Friday going to work, coming back from work, going to school, coming back from school, doing homework, finishing up, preparing something for the next day, waking up early because I have to go take a flight because I have a business trip, oh, I have to have an assignment, I have an exam, oh, I have to do this, I have to do that. Our life is a lot more than that. That is one level of our life. But there are many, many levels in our lives. The level that the Lord wants us to reach to is way beyond our daily occupation, our daily routine. This quote says it very well. It says, Many men go fishing all their lives without knowing that it is not fish they are after. Henry David Thoreau. Many men go fishing all their lives without knowing that it is not fish they are after. And you can ask many people who are very accomplished. If you talk to the elderly and you sit with them to get their wisdom, they tell you what they've been through in their lives you know, those, let's say, they emigrated to Canada, they tell you their story. I was born in 19 such and such. I came to Canada in 1960 such. I did this from this to that. I tried this, I tried that. I worked up north, I worked down south, I went to the east, I went to the west. I got married, I had kids. I did this, I did that, I did that. They tell you their story. And then they tell you their experience from 18, 19, 20, 21 to 60, 65, 70, 75. And they tell you the spectrum of experience they went through. And every single one of them will tell you that the depth of their experience was witnessing the hand of God in their lives, protecting them, strengthening them, supporting them. If they make a mistake, how God brought them out of it safely. And realizing that God is calling them for more. I was visiting this person who was in palliative care for the past few weeks. He was on his deathbed. And I used to see this man years and years ago when I was a younger boy. He was a, you know, the simple, regular example of, you know, a young man in his, you know, 40s, whatever, with his wife, three children, regular life. Hey, how are you? Hey, how are you? Back, in, you know, whenever we'd cross paths at church. And now I see him years later in palliative care, going to visit him, to anoint him with oil, to take his confession, to give him absolution, to offer him Holy Communion. And I see how this man's life did such a transition upwards to the level that God is trying to lead him to. On his deathbed, it was no longer about the job, the kids' schools, the mortgage, the taxes, uh, who's going to win the next federal election, uh, who's going to win tomorrow's hockey game, all these things were another level. He was beyond that. He transcended all of that. 
He was at a point where he's thinking about his eternal life, his eternal rest. And that's all he wanted. Every few days all he wanted was, I just want to receive communion. I just want to receive communion. There was no more requests or needs because it's not fish we're after. St. Peter was taken from being a fisherman to a fisher of men. It's a big difference. Just add that word of between fisher and men and it's a different phrase. Completely different. St. Peter was blessed by the Lord, chosen by the Lord to be that kind of fisher of men. And notice how it's also an experience of growth because it wasn't an immediate I'll go and catch people. It was a growth process which each one of us has to go through. God is calling us to things we may not even be aware of right now. But it doesn't mean that they're all going to be fulfilled right now. They're being fulfilled gradually in our lives. And the condition of the fulfillment is not God saying, you're not ready or I don't want to. It's how eager I am to fulfill His will in my life. The more eager I am for the will of God to be fulfilled in my life, the more it manifests itself naturally in my life. That's how God works with each and every one of us. Yes, there's a time for everything. There's a time for every season. He says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He taught us to pray these words. But God's will is the present. When Moses asked him, What do I tell the people about you? What is your name? He said, I am. I am who I am. God is, is. There was never a time where God wasn't or God won't be. God is always present. And He wants you to live in the present, in the now, and making decisions now. And those decisions have a dramatic effect on the future. And the earlier we can understand and discover that we're not after catching fish, that there's a greater purpose for every one of our lives on earth, then we begin to enter the process of fulfillment. The phase that where my life is being fulfilled day to day, that I'm going further and further along the path God has set before me. We were talking about this in the Bible study last night. And St. Saint Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 2. He says, You are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has prepared beforehand for you to walk in. God has a set plan for our lives and a purpose for this life. Every one of us. And the ultimate purpose of every other purpose that we walk through is our eternal life. And the eternal life of everyone around us. So, fishers of men is basically becoming persons of God and for others. It's basically gradually going from me, 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 what are my needs, what are my wants, I want to do this now, I want to eat this now, I want to sleep, I want to do this, I want to do that, to gradually distancing away myself from that it's no longer about me, that I'm not here for me. I'm here because God created me for His works, to glorify Him, and by living this way, I get fulfilled and content and feeling the peace that surpasses understanding and living for others through God and for God through others. Right? That They say the secret of joy, what? J-O-Y, J, Jesus first, O, others second, Y, yourself last. Those who can get to the point where they live for others, for Jesus and for others through Jesus and Jesus through others, forgetting about themselves in the process God gives them their heart's true desires. Because I promise you, you can be given all the kingdoms of the earth and it won't matter nothing. You will step on it with your foot. St. Paul says, I count it all as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Really, St. Paul, all this is rubbish? Yes, it's all rubbish. It's all rubbish. Because none of it is in the kingdom of heaven. None of it. What's going to go with you to heaven is how you lived for God and others here. That's why St. John writes in Revelation 14, Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on, says the Spirit. Why? Because they have rest from their labors, the labors of life, 
And what? Their works follow them. What they've done here follows them. The good they've done follows them. He says, a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple shall not lose its reward. How much more all the other good you may do. He says, when you do it to the least of my brothers, you do it to me. So good or bad, you're doing it directly to the Lord. So a true fisher of men is becoming a person, a woman or a man of God and for others. So I don't know if you noticed St. Paul's letter today. St. Paul's letter was from the second epistle to the Corinthians chapter 4. So St. Paul basically describes everything that the Lord was trying to tell the disciples when he told them, don't be afraid, from now on you'll catch men. There is a, there is a process, there, is, there are prerequisites for that. There's a way you become a fisher of men or a woman fisher of men there's a way St. Paul describes it so it's beautiful because in today's message in today's meditation we see our two beloved intercessors together in the sermon St. Peter and what happened to him with our Lord and St. Paul describing it in his own words inspired by the Holy Spirit so I'm not going to go through the whole epistle of St. Paul today but I'm going to take snippets of it quickly just to see what St. Paul is telling you this is the criteria you want your life to be fulfilled truly this is the criteria because you don't want to remain stuck spending most of your life chasing fish when God is, has you for a much greater purpose than fish there are no fish in heaven but there are many souls in heaven or many many place, people in heaven and a lot is waiting for people in heaven so St. Paul says what? He begins by this. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. What does he mean? We have this ministry. We've been given a, a responsibility. A true Christian takes on his responsibilities and duties extremely seriously, carefully, and faithfully. Keeping in the back of his mind or her mind the fact that it's not about them. This ministry is God's. We've received mercy St. Pe Peter said, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Depart from me. He says, don't be afraid. From now on you'll catch men. We receive mercy through the honesty given back to God, through true repentance. We don't lose heart. Because of this mercy, we remember and we don't lose heart. He goes on to say what? We have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The focus here is what? We have renounced the things of shame. What does that mean, we have renounced the things of shame? What do you think? What does it mean to renounce the things of shame? We have renounced the things of shame. What does that mean? Repentance. What else? When you renounce something, what does it mean? When you were baptizing your children, the priest told you, repeat after me. First, you look to the west and you rejected something or someone. Do you remember that? Moms and dads, do you remember when you were holding your baby, sponsoring your child's baptism, what did you say? I renounce you, Satan. Renunciation, renouncing is total, permanent, eternal rejection of something that is evil or wrong. So St. Paul is telling us that here. We have renounced the things of shame. Anything the devil tries to make you drop in and fall in, it's shameful. Renounce it. Fight it till your bitter end, till the last breath. And that's the next criteria. You can't be a fisher of men living in shame. Where's the integrity? Where's the credibility? People need to hear and see an example. If they hear the example speaking to them is not a real example, then how are they going to receive it? We receive the ministry, we renounce the things of shame. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. St. Paul is trying to tell us here that if we're becoming fishers of men, when St. Paul spoke, he wasn't speaking about himself. The message of the gospel is not the message of a person. The message of the gospel is the message of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So fishing for men, 
bringing them to Christ is bringing them to Christ, not bringing them to me. That's the third criteria. You following so far? We receive this ministry, renounce the things of shame, we don't preach ourselves. It's not about us. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God, not of us. Reminding ourselves that we are weak. We're human. God said to Adam what? Dust you are and to dust you shall return. When a human being can remind himself of that, he does not fall in the trap of vain glory and envy and self-seeking. This treasure, this ministry, this mercy, this gospel is given in earthen vessels. They're a weak state. That helps me always keep my eyes on Jesus for strength and my eyes on Jesus to make sure the credit and the glory all goes to Him all the time. Therefore we do not lose heart. He says it again. Even though our outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. And he goes on to say this, for our light affliction. So everything you're going to go through to be a true fisher of men is not going to be easy. There will be affliction. St. Paul can speak it most honestly because he went through tons of afflictions. Tons. He was shipwrecked, stoned to death practically, arrested, beaten, insulted, all, you name it. And he called it all a light affliction. Really, St. Paul, how's that light? Because it's light which is because it's but for a moment and is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory while we do not look at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporary but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's why it's light. Even if you live a hundred years on earth in comparison to eternity, what is it? What is a hundred years in comparison to infinity? A grain of sand? It's nothing. That's why the things that are seen, you can see me, but this is temporary. My soul you don't see. It's my soul that will remain. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us a spirit as a guarantee. You're reminded when you feel the pain or the difficulty or the discouragement along the road, you're reminded. God is the one who prepared all this for you. And He gives you His Holy Spirit to dwell in you as a guarantee, as a seal. Here, keep this as a proof, as a guarantee. Till you come back to me, till you meet me in heaven. It's a guarantee. His Spirit is your guarantee. You've been given His Holy Spirit. We walk by faith, not by sight. See, these are all the steps to remember when I'm becoming or trying to be a truly a fisher of men. You don't walk by sight. Don't depend on how you can do things with your mind, with your talents, with the paper and pen. This is by faith. Saying, God, you lead the way. Here are the talents you have given me. Here are the things you told me to do. Lord, I'm going to do them through you, because I can't do them alone. That's why he said, while in prison, St. Paul wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Walk by faith, not by sight. This is all in today's reading, today's epistle, Pauline epistle. Then he goes on to say, Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. I'm reminding myself, this has to be my goal, my aim. When you aim at something, when someone is aiming an arrow, to shoot an arrow, they have to be very precise, correct? To make sure that they get the bullseye. You have to aim carefully. He says, my aim, whether present or absent, is to be well-pleasing to God. So asking myself at every moment, this that I have just done, did it please you, Lord? If it didn't, forgive me and help me to fix. That's your door of repentance and confession. If it did, thank you, Lord, for allowing me, enabling me, lead me to more of what pleases you. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And that's the final part of the criteria. Reminding myself that this life is transient, it's temporary, and these souls matter very much to God. And if they very matter very much to God, I will make it my point and my goal to do my utmost to encourage them, enable them, empower them to choose God. Choose the Lord. 
And that's why we, he said, I constantly try to persuade men. We're not going to persuade everybody. Sadly, we're not going to be able to persuade everyone. But God uses every one of us to fish somewhere. One person can't fish for everyone. But everyone has their responsibility and role to fish, to keep fishing. For the love of Christ compels us. Why all this? Because of God's love. His love compels me. What does it mean to be compelled? Or constrained? What does it mean to be compelled? Hmm? Eagerly longing for something. What else? That's true. What else? Hmm? Something pushes you. You're compelled. I was compelled to do that. I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. I was compelled. When you keep the love of Christ in front of your eyes like that, reminding yourself at every moment, with every breath, how much you are loved by name, known by name in heaven, this will compel you to reciprocate the love back by following the criteria of a true fisher of men. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all. That those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. I no longer live for me, I live for him. This is the final equation. That's why St. Paul said that to the Galatians. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I leave you with this quote to think about throughout the liturgy today. It says what? We are called to be fishers of men, not just keepers of the aquarium. I'll repeat. We are called to be fishers of men, not just keepers of the aquarium. What does that mean? If the church... Yes, Philo. They take, exactly. They take care of everything. Everyone. They look further and further out. Thank you. So, if the aquarium is the church and we're the fish, this is not the whole world, is it? I mean, how many are we in here? It doesn't matter the number. But we're not the whole planet. And either way, you would not be able to fit the whole planet in this church. You would not even to fit the Ligles and sources in this church. You would not be able to fit everyone in one little building. That's why the church was never a building, a physical building of stones and bricks and wood. The church is the body of Christ incarnate. Through His mystery, through His Eucharist, which He gives us, we take Him to give Him. We take Him to give Him. We take from Him to give Him. On and on. And the cycle continues from generation to generation to generation. That's how it works. We're not called to be just, let's float together in this little fishbowl. Oh, we're all good. We're fine. We come to church. We pray. We read the gospel. We receive communion. We have a coffee. Take a sandwich. Go to Sunday school. Go home. Repeat. No. Whatever happened to Sunday afternoon to the following Saturday night? This is where it's no longer just about the aquarium. We come back to the aquarium every week to refuel, recharge, refill, to be in fellowship together, which is one of the four pillars of the early church that led it to grow. But then we go out and continue looking for other fish, looking for other fish. That's how it works. And the larger your scope, the more you drag in. The larger your scope, the more you drag in. When your scope is just like this, then you don't drag in more than that. You need to increase, what is it called in, in, in French? It's le champ de vision. What's champ de vision in English? Field of vision, well that was easy. Field of vision. You need to increase your field of vision. Look with your periphery and think there are many other souls. So while you're standing in here, whenever you're tempted to be preoccupied with minute, minute minor things, don't preoccupy with yourselves with them now during the liturgy this is the time where we need to work together the most every time we meet together for the liturgy which is the work of the people where the priests the deacons the people work together in synergy praying for one another and praying for each other and praying for this and praying for that and remembering him and remembering them and the salvation of the world and the city of ours pray and enlarge your vision your field of vision think 
that it's not just about the bunch of us in the church on Sunday morning. It's about the people on the Liglis and Sources and Lake Breeze and Off the 20 and Dorval and Lachine and Beaconsfield and the rest of the city of Montreal and the rest of the country and the rest of the planet. Increasing your vision drags more fish in all the time. Guaranteed. Because it's his ministry. He's the one bringing in the fish. But he uses us as the hook. So the hook has to follow these criteria that St. Paul described. If you can't remember them, I urge you to go home today, read the second epistle of St. Paul, chapter 4, to the Corinthians, chapter 4 and 5. You'll find it all in there. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Of this day.